Welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to thank you for uh, spending uh, today uh, with me during this uh, vendor tutorial sponsored by uh, Artel. I'd like to talk with you uh, about uh, building a, a sort of a framework for controlling your assay variability and optimizing assay performance through uh, um, a technique we call process optimization. Um, my name is Nathaniel Hentz, and I am the Director of Scientific Market Development with Artel, and uh, I handle a lot of the technical stuff, so uh, you know, toward the end, or at the end of this uh, talk, um, feel free to uh, send me an email. I think uh, that should be provided, and I think SLES will uh, provide a venue for you to ask questions as well. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, talk to you uh, about several things today. And, what I'd like to do is uh, kind of go through those right now. Uh, so our agenda is really going to be talking about sources of assay variability. Um, and, and not just the standard sources. We're going to talk about all-encompassing uh, uh, sources of variability. And we'll tie that together with this idea of process optimization. And when we think about the, the uh, sources of variability and how to really approach it from a, a sort of a standardized approach, uh, we'll be able to see how we can uh, improve assay performance. And then I'd also like to talk about uh, uh, where to use process optimization. It technically, it could be used on any assay, but it works really well uh, for multi-step uh, assays. Uh, these would be complicated assays with uh, several liquid handling steps, um, different reagent additions, uh, washes, those types of things. Uh, and you know, it, ELISA assay formats are, are very common for this. But NGS sample prep or qPCR are, are very uh, good examples of, of assay types that you can use uh, process optimization on. And then finally, and not necessarily in this order, I'd like to talk to you about the uh, sort of standardized measurement uh, platform, and that's the Artel MVS. Um, for uh, existing customers that are on uh, today's uh, tutorial uh, uh, of Artel's uh, customers, um, you know us as a calibration company. And for those of you who don't, um, you know, the, the idea is uh, uh, liquid handling quality control. And it, it's really about uh, ensuring that uh, pipettes, no matter where they are in the world or what type of pipettes, that they're all performing the same. And, uh, I've had this little diagram here, you know, we're looking at a, a single channel manual pipette versus a multi-channel um, manual pipette versus an automated liquid handler in different parts of the world. And when we uh, uh, desire to have 2.5 microliters delivered, we'd like it to be the same no matter what the piece of equipment is, no matter where it is. And uh, so today what I'd like to do is take a little bit of a turn on that and think about applications using this very same uh, technology because ultimately what we're very interested in is the, it's really the concentrations in the particular wells. It's not necessarily the volume, although that's part of it, but ultimately it's the concentrations in the um, uh, uh, microtiter plates. Um, and we're gonna see that uh, if we start thinking about the uh, assay workflow, and I'll explain that as, uh, as we go through this. Um, a real quick uh, a description on the, uh, the, the measurement technology. Um, it's, it's, it's based on a dual die, dual wavelength, uh, ratio ratiometric absorbance uh, technique. And if we take a look at the uh, graphic to the right, uh, it's basically dispensed sample, and that would be the red uh, dye, and that's the so-called quantitative dye. And then there is some sort of a diluent uh, to get it up to a common volume in that well, and that's uh, what we call the non-quantitative um, uh, dispense. Then there's a mix. Uh, we have a validated mixer on the system, and then what we see here is that uh, in the far right hand side, it's the photometric measurements and that's the dual die. So there's, there's two different uh, wavelengths uh, that are being measured. And if we take a look uh, back to the left, uh, that's the equation for this uh, uh, volume measurement. And as you can see, you know, we hear about this uh, dual die, uh, dual uh, wavelength uh, ratio metric absorbance uh, technique. Uh, and you see the absorbance uh, uh, 520 over absorbance of 5, or 730, and then there's some uh, uh, coefficients in there that have been calculated out. 
And then through a derivation of Beer's Law, we're able to calculate the volume of that red dye that's been dispensed. So it's, 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 the measurement part's fairly straightforward, uh, but there's a lot of uh, uh, work that goes on uh, behind the scenes. And this is where sometimes people will hear us talk about uh, NIST traceable, um, and, and there's a lot of stuff that prepares these reagents to make them uh, NIST uh, traceable. And what we have here is the, uh, just the basic outline. I, I, it's just a, basically a different way of viewing what I just told you in the previous slide. Dispense your red solution in a plate, you add your blue diluent, and then the validated uh, plate shaker. Then there's a, a readout, and then there's a report that's, uh, that comes out. And what the report does uh, under the standard terms here is it uh, provides a dispense accuracy and precision. And, and that's what most people know us for. Um, we can look at the entire plate, channel by channel, dispense order. Um, but if we, what we want to do is get people thinking a little bit more about the assay process. So this here would actually be one piece of it. This would be related more to the automated liquid handlers or the uh, pipettes. But uh, what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about um, assay variability and see how we can extend that very same technology into um, evaluating different parts of the assay. Um, what I'd like to do here is uh, just go over a, a quick outline of a generic assay. Um, and again, this is meant for illustrative purposes only. Um, basically, there's some kind of standard preps uh, on the outside. It, it may be calibration curve or controls, and then those are put into the uh, plates in some location. And then sample or compound is put in the remaining wells, and then uh, some uh, you know, reagent uh, would be added, and then maybe a second reagent would be added. And then there's some kind of a mixed step, perhaps, um, either a shaker or uh, the pipetter uh, is doing that. And then there's an incubation and then a read uh, step. And, you know, I alluded to this earlier, uh, when we automate this type of process, uh, we're very good as an industry at uh, ensuring that our liquid handlers are working properly. And by that, I mean, we're very good about calibrating them. We either take advantage of the RTEL MVS system, or we have our own internal uh, methods. So somehow we do that, and so we're, we're typically tra uh, tracking either precision or precision and accuracy. Um, so that part's not new. Um, I think everybody's doing that. Um, what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about the assay workflow. Um, and when we think about what an assay is actually composed of, it's what I, I'm, I'm gonna break it up into three different groups here. Uh, we've got the, the so-called samples and standards, and that's the, the, the things that you do to those samples and standards. And what I have illustrated here, it might be some kind of an extraction or a dilution of the sample. There, there's a preparation of a calibration curve. We have the instrument side of things. Uh, that's liquid handling, that's the automated liquid handler or the pipette. There's incubation, mixing, washing, detection, those, those sorts of things. And then there's the uh, consumables. Um, and this, this would be the reagents, uh, the disposable tips if you're using those, the plates themselves, and the, uh, the plate seals. Uh, and I'm sure there's a few more things in here, but this is really to illustrate that uh, the assay quality is really a function of all of this stuff. It's not just liquid handling. And what we see here in the, the graphic to the right, um, it, it's basically the same assay. Uh, one is uh, performed at, in the top, it's highlighted in red. Uh, that's the okay version of it. And then by considering that's using traditional means of uh, assay development and optimization. But if we think about the assay as a process, uh, we get the box in the, the, the lower part that's highlighted in green. And as we can see, the variability is, uh, is, is much better uh, improved. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Um, so yeah, this, let's, let's get into it, uh, this, this uh, uh, process optimization approach. So again, when I think about this, uh, I, I like to break it down into all of the components that go into an assay. And if we think about it, uh, we have the obvious stuff. There's the liquid handler itself. And, but as a subclass of that, if you look at the very top, we have liquid class optimization. And that is making sure that the liquid handler is doing its job for the liquid that you're using. So uh, it's, it's not just delivering a volume, it's an optimized uh, volume on a, on a per liquid basis. And, and most companies, most liquid handling manufacturers have default settings, um, but most laboratories can start there, but need to optimize those somehow. 
Um, we have labware qualification. This might be uh, disposable tips, uh, plates even. We've got reagent qualification. Um, some people ask me, uh, you know, how do you qualify reagents? Well, there's the biology part of it, but then on the liquid side, um, what we have to think about is if you have uh, an enzyme preparation from two different manufacturers, but they have two different components in them to stabilize or enhance the activity, they may behave vastly differently in the uh, liquid handler, especially in an automated liquid handler. And we've got pipette technique training, mixing washing assessment, um, and then there's uh, liquid handler evaluation. So that's using the right liquid handler for the right job. Um, that's not tweaking it, that's actually evaluating it to make sure that it can do what you need it to. And then you've got the, the, uh, the old uh, uh, instrument calibration, and that's, what, that's really what, what we do as a, as a specialty. But I, I wanted to bring up all these other points here for us. Um, and so for, for process optimization uh, to be executed uh, uh, best, uh, the way I think about it is optimize your assay workflow with Artel MVS technology. So it's basically going around the circle here where appropriate um, and using our Tel MVS to optimize each of these components. And then you do your final optimization with your assay components. And the reason I, I say to do it this way, uh, and, the way, and this is what I've been doing for years, is because there's a huge time savings in here. Um, so in step number one, we remove the biology, but we keep all of the workflow components and we can evaluate and optimize uh, the instrumentation for that. And, and you know, so each readout uh, for a plate may take a minute or two or, or even a couple of minutes, depending on the format. And, 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 you know, most of the times people will optimize their assay with their assay. And uh, the problem with that is it, it works. That's ultimately what you need to do. But uh, the issue is it takes time. If you have an ELISA and you need to evaluate a lot of these different components here, um, that, that could take uh, uh, you know, four or five, six hours uh, per shot. Or an NGS, that's, a, that's an overnight, that's a two-day type of experiment. Um, so as you can see, the time would really add up if you're trying to evaluate these things. Um, so again, optimize the, the, uh, the assay workflow with MVS first, and then uh, do your final optimization with your assay components, or take advantage of and use the biology as your final readout. And just to, to give you an idea of what I mean by this, uh, let's take a look at some example uh, Artel MVS applications. Uh, there's a number of things that the system can do uh, in addition to the calibration. Um, but what I'm going to do here is focus on these uh, uh, highlighted uh, bullet points. Um, you can uh, you know, basically uh, evaluate uh, disposable tip performance, uh, mixing techniques, plate washing. Uh, we can optimize the automated liquid handler uh, liquid classes as well, uh, training and uh, serial dilution if you're actually uh, 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 optimizing the process for uh, serial uh, dilution of your standards. Um, so there's a, there's a ton of things that this uh, very same system can do. Um, and let's spend a few minutes and talk about those. Uh, mixing efficiency. Um, this graphic looks very similar to the one I showed earlier. It's you dispense your solution um, in there and put your diluent in there and then you perform your mix method. So we don't do anything different. It's what your proposed mix method is. You do a read plate, you get your results. And as I'm illustrating here in the far right-hand side, uh, there's a mean volume, our, our target is 10 microliters. So we have a mean volume in this case of 11 and a half microliters and the CV of the plate is 18 and a half percent. Take that very same plate, the exact same plate, don't do anything else to it, and then put it on the Artel plate shaker. And uh, remember, this is a validated plate shaker. Uh, we've spent a lot of time, money, and resources to make sure that these reagents are combined in the most efficient manner. And then we read, read that plate. And then in this case, what you see is the mean volume is 9.95, plate CV is 1.3%. So in this case here, you very clearly can see that this particular mix method that was employed is it's not sufficient. So what I'd like to do here, just to, for a, a quick sec, is talk about the assay itself. Um, uh, you could, 
if, if you think about these, these differences here, um, you know, it, this here takes about two minutes to, or I, I'll say four minutes. It's one, you know, two minutes for each, each of these plate reads is two, two minutes uh, each times two, four minutes. If you were to run an assay in here and you want to change your mix method, um, that's going to take uh, however many times you need to adjust it by however long your assay is. And uh, I can get most, mostly guarantee that most assays aren't done in a couple of minutes. So what we're doing here is evaluating only the mix. If the mix isn't working here, it's going to be really challenging when you have a biochemical reaction uh, uh, taking place. Um, let's think about the uh, disposable pipette tip evaluations. And if, if we, uh, uh, many in the high throughput screening industry just grab tips and we run them and we have a favorite brand that happens to work. Um, but we also have, uh, it's a competition between that and the automated liquid handling vendors who uh, they have their own particular tip types for that particular piece of equipment. And there's a reason for that. It's because they usually have high quality tips and they've studied them. They know how it works and behaves on their system. And what we're looking at here is an example. Um, I'll highlight it. Um, if we look at the ALH, that's the automated liquid handler vendor recommended. That's lot number one. Um, and again, our target volume is 15 microliters. That's working, working pretty good. We can do another uh, a lot. This is a lot too. It's performing very similarly. And then uh, we, we take a look because we're interested in saving cost because everybody would like to save, uh, save money. Um, and, and vendor number two, this may be a universal uh, uh, tip manufacturer, bulk manufacturer. Um, 50% of the cost, but if you look at the difference in precision and accuracy, uh, very clearly there's a, a difference in performance. So, you know, this would be up to you as, a, as, a, as the assay development scientist or, or the automation specialist to decide if this is uh, significant enough to warrant a change back to your uh, vendor tips. Um, and again, this is all done in the absence of biology. If it's, if it's having challenges here with uh, these, uh, these MVS reagents, that's just that there's basically two dyes being mixed. If it's having a challenge here, can you imagine what it's going to be like for an assay that's delivering proteins and other types of solutions at, at whatever volumes, and then you've got multiple steps. So it really adds up. So this is, a, again, it's a very fast, efficient way of measuring uh, the performance of, um, of your uh, pipette tips. And we've got uh, one more example, or maybe a, another example here of plate washer assessment. If you're working with cell-based assays or you're uh, performing an ELISA, um, again, you dispense your solution perform your wash method and uh, you know, do whatever it, it needs to do. So you remove the, the fluid and then uh, add diluent back to the well and then do a measurement and uh, you look for patterns uh, in this case. So you know, accuracy means nothing in this case. What we're looking for is uh, essentially a decrease of a signal down to nothing and then we want the same performance in each of these tips. So high outliers, they, they usually are uh, due to faulty cannulae uh, or the high average signal overall, poor aspiration uh, in general. So here's an example of what that would look like. Um, if you look at the axis uh, on, on the, the, the far left here, it's a residual solution and we have our three replicates. And what we notice here, there's, a, there's several outliers um, that I've highlighted uh, in orange. Uh, that's either due to damaged tips or they're clogged. So what you'd want to do is, is fix the stuff um, somehow. So either you go through a, a, a more rigorous cleaning cycle or replace any damaged uh, tips. And uh, you, you, you perform the same experiment. This is the, the so-called serviced um, uh, uh, set of data. So you can see those outliers have disappeared. But what we also notice is we still have residual solution uh, in, our, in our wells. Um, and then we go through one optimization step. So this might be uh, adjusting it somehow, either a number of cycles, the, uh, the depth or the location. And what we see is the reduction of the overall signal. So, you know, again, this would be if you know your assay is very sensitive to some of this residual solution, you'd want to optimize your liquid handler to remove all of this. You'd want it all be, to be down uh, at, at zero or close to zero. Okay, so this is just an example of how we see these different levels of improvement. Um, and again, 
this takes just a few minutes uh, for each of these reads. Can you imagine doing an ELISA uh, and, and doing a study like this? Because typically what happens is you look at your data and just like, ah, I've got really bad data. Uh, let me go do a cleaning uh, step or you do something to the plate washer. Sometimes it requires an optimization. So um, again, I, I want you to, to think about this as a way to evaluate the different steps uh, with something that is uh, very rapid. Um, and again, this is, uh, it's very simple chemistry. So it's just basically two dyes. We're not, uh, we're not there's no biology at this stage. Uh, so if it's, if it's misbehaving here, it's gonna misbehave for your assay. Um, We've also got a very rapid uh, method, again, the same concept uh, where we can optimize your automated liquid handler parameters. These would be things like uh, uh, the pre-air gaps, post-air gaps, and aspirate and dispense rates, those types of things. Um, you know, whatever, the overall speed, wet versus dry dispense. It's whatever you're thinking of employing for your uh, automation method. You can test those, and again, Test them with uh, the Artel MVS reagents uh, before you use the biology because you want to get it optimized in the most rapid manner uh, possible. And this also allows you to eventually uh, calibrate um, your system appropriately using the different uh, fluid types. And then you would add your biology. And again, uh, we, we talked about the tips and cannulas. It's uh, you know, you have ways of rapidly evaluating these, these things. Um, and again, here's a, an example of a liquid class optimization. Uh, that, that's really about uh, you know, how to optimize, the, get the best performance out of your liquid handler. On the far left panel, we have the default uh, liquid class that comes right out of the, uh, the box, basically. It's, it's uh, set up and programmed by the automation, uh, the automated liquid handling uh, a company. Uh, you, you run it and you find, well, it doesn't really work that great. Uh, my target volume is five microliters. I'm only getting 3.7. So what you'd want to do is uh, optimize it. And we're showing an example here. After a couple of rounds of very quick optimization steps, uh, we're right back up to the accuracy and precision needed. So again, most default liquid classes are not optimal for all solutions, um, but they are incredibly critical. Um, We'll spend a little bit of time now talking about how you employ this for like a real assay. So what I'm showing here is a, is a typical ELISA protocol. And I did this on purpose because it's, it's you know, a, a very complex assay. Uh, they are challenging to automate, but they can be. Um, and what we have here are just a number of steps. So how, if, if we have this kind of a protocol in front of us, how would we uh, evaluate all of these uh, different steps and components uh, using Artel MVS. And that's, that's what I wanted to show here, where you see these stars, you could perform the, uh, the blue uh, stars indicates the wash verification. So you can look at that in all st uh, stages here where it's highlighted. You can look at the volume verification. Um, and again, that might be liquid class optimization type of thing. Uh, serial dilution accuracy, mixing verification, um, all of these things are all sort of tied together, but uh, what's nice about this is we've got a standardized method that you can uh, uh, analyze all components of this. And the great thing about this is we don't have to wait for all these one hour incubation times and um, mixings and uh, temperature. We don't have to do that. It's, this is in absence of the assay. Uh, once we've got this locked down, now we go back into the assay and then uh, put that in. So uh, this, this map here, uh, this is basically, a, it, it's, if you think about a protocol, uh, like the one I just showed you, uh, this is the, the way I would break it down. It, it's, it's sort of complex, but uh, what I wanted to show you is all the uh, levels of uh, connectivity of an assay um, and how you go about uh, measuring it. Um, so again, you've got the wash steps, you've got the volume verifications, you can look at uh, mixing steps or incubation. Uh, we can even look at uh, order of reagent additions. Um, if, like if you have components one and two, could it be components two and one? Sometimes you get better performance um, um, based on that, depending on volumes and such. So uh, it's a, it gives you a nice comprehensive way of approaching your assay process before your biology. And uh, what we see here, uh, we've got a, it, it's it's very similar to one of my first uh, few slides. Uh, it's before process optimization. We've got four different compounds. They're structure, structurally related. 
and we have uh, on the left axis it's, its potency. So what we see here is it, it's a, it, this is a, an optimized assay, but then that was then by going through normal channels and then going to a, a, this idea of process optimization by studying and optimizing the system using MVS and then applying your biology, um, you're able to tighten those numbers up. So the potencies are about the same, the variability is uh, much improved. So what that allows you to do in this case is um, uh, make uh, better calls, better decision making, um, because you have more statistically relevant uh, separation of your, of your compounds. And again, if you're working with patient samples, as you can imagine, this, this might be a high throughput screening uh, example, but if you're working with patient samples, it's the same concept. Uh, the better the data, the better decision making uh, that, that we have. So uh, in, uh, we've talked about a lot of things today. So just uh, just wanted to summarize very quickly, uh, kind of what we talked about. Um, so this Artel MVS that, that was uh, described, some of you work with it and you know about it. Some of you are new to it. Uh, it's, it's great for calibrations of uh, liquid handlers, but we can use it to actually evaluate many components of an assay workflow. Uh, and again, liquid handler performance, we talked about that, but mixing, plate washing, lab performance, um, these are all key parts of an overall assay workflow, so we've got to consider those. Those are not insignificant. And then, uh, you know, the, the time uh, can, that can be saved, you know, think about this. It's minutes. It's literally minutes uh, instead of hours or days. So if you use your assay to, to study all of this, which you're going to have to eventually, but if you use it for all of these steps uh, that don't need to be, um, uh, you know, that's going to take a long time. So you can shave a, a, a large chunk of time off and it's, uh, you've got nice quantitative data. Um, you know, you can even take to your financial people and say, hey, I need to use these more expensive tips because they give me the best performance, um, that, you know, justification. Um, and, you know, data quality is improved. Uh, so what we're doing is, um, uh, we're, we're optimizing it to the best of its ability of that assay. And, and I'm not here to say that, uh, that people are doing a bad job uh, optimizing assays. What I'm saying is if we think about things a little bit different, um, we can actually get more out of our data because we've improved uh, the assay by reducing variability. Because there's a lot of interplay between these uh, sources of variability. Um, and again, uh, if you think about this tool as more than just a calibration device, uh, e efficiency is achieved. And, and you, know, you can reduce method transfer problems. Uh, it's been very successful uh, uh, taking uh, a, a good assay uh, and, and, and ferreting out the uh, sources of potential variability and fixing those before it gets into a, a method transfer situation. Um, and it's also a great uh, a troubleshooting tool. I've, I've used it so many times as a troubleshooting uh, tool in my in my old lab. Um, but a lot of our a lot of our customers are doing that too. But again, I want to open people's minds more than liquid handling calibration device. It's an assay optimization device. And again, uh, last uh, a bullet point here down at the bottom. It, it, it's it's what you're doing is is. Uh, uh, a, a better control is what you want out of that process. And, and you're looking at that assay as a workflow uh, and you're able to reduce variability, um, improve data quality. And, and really uh, I'd say if you're, in a, if you're transferring from manual to automated, you're able to uh, minimize that uh, uh, assay transfer time, or even if it's from one lab to another. And I'd like to thank you once again. Um, I, I really appreciate you joining me today uh, for this uh, tutorial. Uh, feel free to contact me directly um, at enhance at artel.co uh, or follow the normal channels through SLAS. They'll have a, a spot for you to enter your questions. Um, and I thank you very much.